And coming up on Joy News Prime, the number of hungry people globally doubles since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Food Programme is urging governments across Africa to invest in agricultural production to avert a possible food insecurity. Also tonight, the bird flu outbreak in Ghana rages with at least seven regions recording cases. Tonight, we'll take you to the Bono region where officials are taking steps to protect birds there. I have taxed my district officers to be on the alert and look out for farms which are recording high mortality rates so that uh, we, they will send samples to us when they will further send it to Accra. We'll also speak to the veterinary service for an update on measures they introduced to stem the tide. Later, here on Joining News Prime President of the Upper West Regional House of Chiefs appeals to government to ensure roads built in the region are of high quality uh, to forestall the devastation suffered by the people in the recent floods. We are expecting government, we stated that we have been crying over our poor state of road infrastructure of this region to government after government. And much later, government begins distribution of laptops to teachers in public schools as it expresses confidence the move will improve quality of education and make the country globally competitive. One, lap, one teacher, one laptop program. Each teacher at every level of education, from kindergarten to senior high school, will receive a laptop. In business fixing our infrastructure deficit, first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana calls for policy that will account for spending and ensure value for money. First is the need to enhance efficiency of public spending, expenditure rationalization, and the value for money projects that will deliver projects more efficiently. No matter the efforts we make towards enhancing domestic revenue mobilization, we will continue to experience chronic fiscal deficits and a growing debt burden if we do not take steps to rationalize our expenditure levels. We have details of these and more, plus the latest in sports. You want to stay with us on Join News Prime, coming to you live from our studios here at Kukumlimi in Accra, on your digital TV, because you are free to air. DSTV Channel 421, Go TV 144. This is your home of independent, fearless, credible, and impactful journalism. I am Ernest Mina. Health authorities in the Ashanti region are alarmed at the spate of public misinformation and myths about the COVID-19 vaccine. Among the misconception is a video in circulation purporting bodies of persons vaccinated in the ongoing exercise turned electromagnetic. While well, Deputy Health Director in charge of public health, Dr. Michael Roxnej fears the myth, if not addressed, could breed vaccine hesitancy among the populace and erode gains made in the fight against COVID-19. A humanitarian of our health decks is more in the following report. In a viral social media video, a man who claims to be a police officer alleges his mobile phone sticks to his body moments after taking his COVID-19 vaccine. The source of the video is unknown and the narration does not give information about the type of vaccine he took. The Ashanti Regional Health Directorate says it is concerned with this type of misinformation and several others in circulation. The directorate has launched investigations into the claim and several others in public domain. Dr. Michael Roxinej is the deputy health director in charge of public health. We received complaint through the media of um, some persons becoming uh, electromagnetic following um, COVID-19 vaccination. We became very much alarmed, so we set out to investigate the veracity of this. We see it as a major threat now that we are getting a lot of vaccines. But how true is the claim COVID-19 vaccines produce electromagnetic reactions to the human body? We've got individuals who have taken the vaccine 
at a vaccination point and then uh, got them to attach their phone to their upper arm. Some of them, the phone stuck momentarily and then fell off. Others it didn't. We also made these people wash the sites uh, of vaccination um, with water to remove any um, creams or oils that may be on the skin and also cleaned the surface of the phone with alcohol tissue to remove any oil on it. And when they attached it, it didn't. So we, we, we concluded that the, the sebum or that oil on the skin has a sticky property that is wax and oil mixed. So that if you, are, if you have uh, sebum on your skin and you attach any material, any light material like uh, even plastic would attach, a key would attach. Joy News visited some vaccination centers, including the Kumasi Metro Clinic, to test the claim on newly vaccinated people. <laughs> The regional health directory says it will not lodge a complaint with the Ghana Police Service against the said officer for disciplinary action, but it wants the police administration to take interest in persons who spread false information about COVID-19 vaccine. Anti-vaccine people always have um, have um, an aim, so um, we. We don't want to take that action now. The police are where they can take actions without us making any formal complaint. From Kumasi, for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. Now, governments across Africa are being urged to increase investment in agricultural production as the COVID-19 pandemic increases food insecurity across the globe. The World Food Programme has warned that the number of hungry people globally has doubled since the outbreak of the pandemic last year. The Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, is leading efforts to help the continent expand more investment in the agricultural sector. It's gathering African agricultural sector leaders leaders for a summit next week to fashion out how to build more resilient farming systems in Africa and within Green Revolution Forum. Well, the acting country manager of Agra, Bashiru Musa, is joining us via Zoom for more on this. Uh, we are grateful that you could join us again, Mr. Musa. The question I asked you was uh, for you to help us understand how COVID-19 is impacting food security, first of all in Ghana, then paint the continental picture for us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, obviously, I mean, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has had you know, negative impact on the agricultural sector globally, not just Ghana, but then globally. Uh, currently, we are seeing farmers struggling to get the expected inputs like fertilizer and seeds um, on, on a timely basis. And uh, this is actually even compounded a situation where we have you know, the, the closure of our borders to human movement across the sub-region which is also impacting negatively on food security among others. At the same time, we are also witnessing, you know, food price volatility as a direct result of, of the COVID-19. So for us, I think what is important at this point is for all of us, the media involved, the government, the private sector, the development partners, for us to really join forces and support the agricultural sector with a targeted financial investment and the moral support that it requires for, for it to really be able to move in the next steps. What is also really very important is that at this point in time, the, 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 the COVID has really impacted the agricultural sector. So it is a bit struggling. So we need you know, the, the contribution of everybody, the media, the, the, the private sector, the public sector, for us to really engage the farmers because at this point in time, they need much of our support at the moment. And there have been efforts to meet the uh, sustainable development goals. Now, how do you see this, uh, you know, this pandemic affecting the efforts to, to meet that goal? Yeah, the, the sustainable development goals, one, you know, talks about no poverty. The second one talks about zero hunger. Obviously, the challenges, you know, like the COVID-19 and also uh, climate change, you know, are really threatening the effort to meet these goals. 
And so for us, I think what is also evident is the fact that we need to transform our food systems to make it more resilient. And for us, I mean, the, our situation would have been worse off had it not been for some kind of you know, concerted effort by the government, especially a uh, case in point is the planting for food and jobs, which has provided enormous amount of benefit to smallholder farmers, you know, in terms of them accessing inputs such as seeds and fertilizer. This has really sort of, you know, watered down the, the, col the colossal effect of this, uh, you know, pandemic. So in a way, Ghana has benefited a lot from the PFG. But then what is also very critical is that we need to marshal forces uh, because, I mean, uh, the critical factor is okay. the recovery. And how do we really, you know, sort of transform the, the food systems in Africa? Okay. And just briefly, before you go, the Alliance for Green Revolution Forum uh, is coming up next week. What exactly is this about? And, you know, how does this tackle the issue at hand? You know, I mean, as a matter of fact, food security is a matter of national security. So the African Green Revolution Forum is, is one of the leading fora where matters of agricultural importance and for that matter, African ag uh, agricultural transformation is, is, is actually, you know, uh, a very topical issue. So this forum provides the platform where these issues are really discussed to the core passionately. Now, the essence of it is to really inspire commitment and actions from all parties within the food ecosystem. And so this year's AGRF, uh, which is um, the 12th edition uh, of the summit, will be held in, in the um, uh, Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, from the 7th to the 10th of September. And it is expected to bring a wide range of stakeholders from across Africa, including the government officials, the private sector, uh, participants, the development partners, you know, the academia, the farmers, to really discuss and fashion out how we can transform the African agricultural sector to ensure food security and income security at all levels. Thank you very much. That's Bashir Mohammed, the acting country manager for Agra, joining us there on the impact of COVID-19 on food security. But away from that, the bird flu outbreak in Ghana is raging with more regions uh, recording cases. At least seven regions have been hit by the virus with tens of thousands of birds either destroyed or dead. At the start of the outbreak, government rolled out uh, containment measures, including a ban on the move of beds, movement of beds and enhanced contact tracing. But that has not helped slow down the spread. We'll speak to officials of the veterinary services shortly. But first, here's a report from the Bono region on how officials are working to ensure beds there are safe. Veterinary authorities in the Bono East region are instituting measures capable of preventing the outbreak of avian influenza, popularly known as bird flu, in the region. Regional Veterinary Officer Dr. Antonio Setutu told Joy News that the department is monitoring the influx of bears into the region as well as the condition of bears within the various farms across the region. To date, five regions in the country have recorded uh, cases of outbreak of bird flu, namely Greater Akla region, Vota region, Central region, Western North and Ashanti region. Bono East region so far has not recorded avian influenza. I have tasked my district officers to be on the alert and look out for farms which are recording high mortality rates so that uh, we, they will send samples to us and they will further send it to Accra labor, Veterinary Laboratory for further testing to authenticate whether we have the outbreak of the virus that is bird flu in our region or not. The department is also organizing sensitization workshops for farmers to educate them on various preventive measures to save their farms from the possible outbreak of the flu. Plants are afoot to organize uh, sensitization programs, education programs, to uh, advise them on measures that they've got to put in place to prevent the virus, that is a bird flu virus, from affecting their bears. Um, we have started at the, at the official office level, and sooner than later we'll move to radio stations, we'll organize training workshop for them to ensure that they go by the biosecurity measures uh, 
to ensure that uh, bird flu is prevented from our region. Dr. Antonio Osei-Tutu, however, cautioned the public to consume only well-cooked chicken and chicken products to stay safe from infections. I have to say emphatically that in this era, where we have outbreak of bird flu in other regions, which haven't got into my region, Bono is yet, I'll say to all the public that they can consume chicken and chicken products, but except that they must be very well cooked before they consume them. Um, we know that the virus, uh, bird flu, uh, the infection is of viral origin, and the virus die at temperature between 60 and 70. And we know that well-cooked foods, chicken and chicken product, is at 100 degrees Celsius. So that if we adhere to such regulation that we must cook them very well at 100 degrees, the virus would have died, and therefore the product becomes suitable for consumption. Reporting for Joy News. Anas Sabit, Tichiman. We are joined by Dr. Benjamin Kisi Sasu, a veterinary uh, doctor and a member of the Risk Communication and Social Mobilization Technical Committee at the Veterinary Service. Uh, Dr. Kisi Sasu, thank you for joining us. First, uh, bring us up to speed with the cases since the last update. Okay. Good evening to your viewers. I am so happy to July recorded us and we have entered to the seventh week. We have had the cases moving up to 46 cases. Uh, lucky for us, uh, from the last update that was given on the 16th to 29th, we have, we have realized that um, from 22nd to 29th, we had only three new cases. And uh, for the seven regions, most regions didn't record a new case. Uh, for us, looking at the data and looking at the situation is some kind of relief to us, hoping that if there'll be other cases in the next few weeks to come, we're hoping uh, it won't escalate for more mm. and we'll start seeing a decline. That's what we are hoping for. So for the first time, Greater Accra didn't record a case, Central Region didn't, Volta Region, as well as Western North, we recorded one case. We're hoping these regions will keep it at um, at what the, uh, the number that we have already seen. Um, the problem we are having with new regions having this um, bird flu coming to their place. And that means that other regions, which uh, I've not also gotten so far, need to make sure they stick to the um, biosecurity at their farms. And to tell you, to tell you, uh, the few cases that have come in, we have seen big farms join in. A farm with a population of 10,000, some with 5,000, some almost 20,000 joining in, which means that no farm, commercial farm should uh, relax thinking is always having a system. Mm. Just a, a slight delay or a relax of the protocol or preventive measures could bring this uh, bear flu to, uh, to your farm. And let's uh, not forget that uh, the bear flu is also not only spread just by the human movement. They are wildlife or bear that move and fly mm. around in the original travel by this base, as you could see, it was so shocking to have seen about five to ten uh, of the people farms joining in. So this is quite a lesson to mm. all uh, farmers that they need to continue not to relax. And this system you are asking for, a system that everyone needs to do it, not just because we currently have a um, uh, bird flu in the system. It was measures that they're supposed to do so to prevent any viral or any disease from entering their farms. It's also that some of the cases we are recording the investigation team realized that still some farmers were visiting each other, especially in the case that we, we just uh, had last week. There was a farmer who had it, and his other college farmers went to console him. And Veterinary authorities in the Bono East region are instituting measures capable of preventing the outbreak of avian influenza, popularly known as bird flu, in the region. 
Regional Veterinary Officer Dr. Antonio Setu to told Joy News that the department is monitoring the influx of bears into the region as well as the condition of bears within the various farms across the region. To date, five regions in the country have recorded uh, cases of outbreak of bird flu, namely Greater Akla region, Vota region, Central region, Western North and Ashanti region. Bono East region so far has not recorded avian influenza. I have tasked my district officers to be on the alert and look out for farms which are recording high mortality rates so that uh, we, they will send samples to us and they will further send it to Accra labor, Veterinary Laboratory. Apologies for the break there. We had a little technical hitch, but let's go back to Zoom and speak to uh, Dr. Kisi Sasu, who is with the risk communication uh, team of the veterinary service. Uh, Doc, you introduced a number of measures, uh, especially to prevent the movement of birds. Would you say that uh, that has been adhered to by many of the farmers? Okay, um, looking at movement of birds, Normally, uh, it happened at two major uh, stages. First, are they old when they are in their farm? So when they are due for market, that they move them uh, from their farm. And so far, uh, with monitoring the various live market where they move to, we haven't recorded any case from. So we can't find out pinpoint that there has been, it is one of the cause. What we are currently seeing is farmers visiting each other, uh, which we have asked them not to do, especially some people visit affected farmers to find out in a locality. And also improper disposal of bears, dead bears by these farmers is also a major cause. When we get to the scene and we before we depopulate, we ask them where are the other bears. And realize that wherever they place it, it wasn't properly done, wasn't well buried. Some were left just around, were not well done. And people end up some somewhere even closer to places that people do pass. And the spread was easy. And when you get there, some of the farmers who uh, who come out and said it happened, they complained to their colleague, but their colleague did nothing. To support, uh, help this situation, mm -hmm. so that's a big deal. Because yeah. some people have been burying or disposing these bears closer to where people pass. Mm. And, and you did say that even though the update shows that you've had a few cases, I think you mentioned forty-seven. Uh, some of the regions have recorded have not recorded new cases. Uh, would you say that then the situation is yes. under control? Yes. Uh, once. Uh, when the, the outbreak happens and we are within a certain period, we are not recording cases, it means that we are breaking a cycle because every group we are getting a case, it might mean that that person or they have had a case, those people working there, uh, we have to find out those who they got in contact to. Once they got in contact to other people or in the vicinity, it means probably if the other people they got into contact to didn't follow the preventive measures, are likely also to pick the cases. So when we have a period where we are not recording new cases, then we are being sure that very soon we'll get, we'll, get, we'll get to a place whereby the case will be coming down and we can even have the outbreak ending. Uh, so are, are you looking in that happen. regard? But all depends on. In that regard, are you looking at introducing new measures to make sure that uh, we do not uh, go back on the gains that we have made? Um, all will depend on the, we are just waiting for uh, one week to see. And hopefully next week, uh, the regional veterinary officers together with the director will meet in Tamale to also look at the issue. Right. So from there, they will come out with something they feel will help. If we feel they have to be more stiffer preventive measures, then we have to do so for Maragana will do so. Thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Kisi Sasu. He is a member of the Risk Communication uh, Committee of the Veterinary Services, joining us with an update of the outbreak of bird flu. So, yes, there have been a new cases by way of update, but some of the regions, uh, mainly in Accra, uh, you know, have not recorded uh, new cases, and they are hoping that they'll be able to keep this under control. Away from that, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ghana has stirred controversy in carrying the wrath of critics of Government Agenda 111 Hospital Project, uh, Right Reverend Professor Joseph Obrie Boamante has described critics of Government Agenda 111 as witches 
who needed deliverance. The project is expected to see the construction of 111 district hospitals, regional hospitals, and two new psychiatric hospitals. Many have praised the investment, which will be one of the largest in the country's health sector in the history of the country. But there have also been the critics, particularly the minority in parliament. While the moderate of the presbyter says people who criticize the building of hospitals can only be witches and wizards and need prayers. He was speaking at the commissioning of the Ascent Praso Presby Hospital in the central region. Hey, yet me my politics the DA more to the point he said, yeah, yet in here more, yeah, new hospitals, Papa. We have allowed politics to dominate our lives, that we fail to see the good in everything happening around us. We are in debt. We lack good hospitals as compared to what is this abroad? Let's say OBC, Obey 111. Now what you want to work for? Are we paying for? And if someone says he's constructing 101 hospitals, and then you are angry, you are a witch. And for the pastors who want to exercise witchcraft, please deal with such people. Let's support good initiatives. We are watching because you said you will construct 101 hospitals. If you don't, we shall criticize you. But more importantly, do not give us substandard hospitals and clinics. Well, the minority is not taking this lightly at all. The ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Governor Minta Kando, uh, who has been quite vociferous on this matter, says the comments by the moderator is unfortunate, adding they will continue to be witches if holding government accountable means just that. If you are comfortable if you are with your answers for the questions we have raised, you should go ahead and say so. We are in this country when we had moderators saying that people who, 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 who were ruling this country were breeds of knowledge. That they were... All of a sudden, there are a, a, a crop of wise men in government, and so nobody should criticize them. And so nobody should criticize them. And if you criticize, you are a witch or you are a wizard. You expect all of us to keep quiet. Who we'll continue to be witches and wizards? Because we we'll continue to criticize them. And you have politicians now speaking for clergy. I mean, are we not ashamed of ourselves? As a member of parliament and, I mean, a spokesperson on the health committee, I don't have the right to criticize government on health, uh, health policies. I don't have the right. I don't have the right to raise issues of funding when government says they will do projects. I don't have the right to raise issues when government has said clearly about four years ago that they were going to embark on such projects and they failed. I don't have the right to raise issues on government. That, uh, there's the same president who said he was going to give, I mean, one million dollars to each constituency every year. And as I speak to you and now, a member of parliament, I haven't seen any. To ART, that's it. Please, uh, please, please. You're watching Join News Prime with me, Ernest Minu. Still to come, government begins distribution of laptops to teachers in public schools as it expresses confidence the move will improve quality of education and make the country globally competitive. The one, lap, one teacher, one laptop program. Each teacher at every level of education, from kindergarten to senior high school, will receive a laptop. And coming up in business, fixing our infrastructure deficit, first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana calls for policy that will account for spending and ensure value for money. Is the need to enhance efficiency of public spending, expenditure rationalization, and the value for money projects that will deliver projects more efficiently. No matter the efforts we make towards enhancing domestic revenue mobilization, we will continue to experience chronic fiscal deficits and a growing debt burden if we do not take steps to rationalize our expenditure levels. Details after this break, don't go away. Yeah, welcome to Business. I'm Charles IG. The first Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana is calling for a policy on expenditure rationalization and value for money projects, among others, to enable the country to deliver projects more efficiently and enhance the fiscal economy. Dr. Matthew Poku Afari said no matter the efforts made towards enhancing domestic revenue, failure to rationalize public expenditure will trigger continuous chronic fiscal deficit and growing de debt levels. 
He spoke at a public lecture organized by the University of Ghana Business School. This infrastructure deficit is estimated at about $7 billion annually over the next 10 years. According to the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Maxwell Opokuafari, there's the need to implement a policy to account for government spending and ensure value for money projects. He believes the high levels of government spending calls for fiscal consolidation that is targeted at reducing overall financing gap to sustainable levels and achieving structural fiscal balance over the medium term. And the first is the need to enhance efficiency of public spending, expenditure rationalization, and the value for money projects that will deliver projects more efficiently. No matter the efforts we make towards enhancing domestic revenue mobilization, we will continue to experience chronic fiscal deficits and a growing debt burden if we do not take steps to rationalize our expenditure levels. The high levels of government spending required to close the huge infrastructure deficit and debt are limiting fiscal room for maneuver. This therefore calls for the kind of fiscal consolidation that involves both revenue raising measures and expenditure rationalization policies with the aim of reducing the overall fiscal deficit to sustainable levels and achieving structural fiscal balance over the medium term. Dr. Opokwafari also suggested that a strong policy is developed to enforce tax collection of the informal sector. He indicated that when taxation is formalized, it will increase the tax net as only 2.4 million Ghanaians are tax compliant. It beggars to believe that a country of over 30 million with over 16 million active Momo users, which is an indication of economically active persons, there are only 2.4 million individual taxpayers. That this really show that we have the capacity to deliver? It is not going to be possible to meet our developmental needs with such a tax base and help widen the tax net. The replacement of 10 numbers with the Ghana card has increased the registered 10 numbers from some 5 million to over 15 million. This will help bring in a lot more people into the tax bracket going forward and facilitate the raising of revenue from a large informal sector. The informal sector comprises micro and small enterprises and will require a simplified and modified tax system to bring them into the tax pool. It is for this reason that the recent announcement by the Vice President of the Republic to intro introduce the modified taxation regime is very critical and could unlock the binding constraint to task collection in Ghana. Meanwhile, Acting Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Nanaba Apia Amfo, has charged government to fulfill its promises to the private sector. She holds that a self resilient economy depends on a booming private sector. For the private sector to be the engine of growth for inclusive and sustainable development, it is important for government to establish credibility beyond doubt that, that it is managing its resources well through a robust macroeconomic system, well-functioning institutions, and a well-regulated and efficient financial system. It is my hope that tonight's lecture and deliberations afterwards will lead this country to think critically to tackle the issue of macroeconomic management head-on and rethink options for development finance, especially with regard to expenditure rationalization and domestic revenue mobilization. In addressing our developmental needs as a country, as we seek the path of self-sufficiency in financing developmental projects. Now, we'll be buying locally grown chicken at a more subsidized price in a year or two because Venkumati Group, a Dutch uh, poultry company, is coming to Ghana. Now, Venkumati Group offers solutions in housing, egg handling, and climate control for any type of poultry house. It is expected to invest $200 million across the country. We have more in this report. A Dutch poultry company, Venkomatic Group, is collaborating with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the Ministry of Finance to set up branches in the Greater Accra, Ashanti and Northern regions. The presence of the company will increase the number of hatcheries in the country to minimize importation of day-old chicks, which will lead to a reduction in the price of chicken. Here is Samuel Debra, consultant for Venkomatic Group in Ghana. The partnership that we are talking of, they are they have gotten the loan for us to uh, invest in this particular project. Okay, so the partnership is going to be the Ministry of Agri 
and then a private uh, 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 partner who will come and run the system, okay, to repay the loan back to the bank. And they've gotten um, 36 million euros for this particular project for three setups, and these are pilots, okay. Afterwards, then we move to the other regions to, you know, establish some over there. And we've earmarked um, uh, at Jusu in the Ashanti region, okay. And then we are uh, going to do the uh, file processing in Tamale. Okay. Technical lead of USDA's Ghana Poultry Project, Ramon Dente, believes that the presence of the group will lead to increasing market share of the poultry industry and make use locally the two billion CD fund allocated for importing poultry. It's widely held that Ghana imports about 350,000 metric tons of poultry meat. So the idea is that we are trying to close that gap because if, if, if we ban it now we cannot feed ourselves. There will be food insecurity in Ghana. So the idea is that if we want to um, supply maybe up to 25 percent of that number, that means we need to produce up to almost 60 million bears a year. And that translates the amount of feed that we need to give them, the daily checks, the breeder farms, the hatcheries, all the facilities, we don't have it now. So this is the first step towards increasing the market share of the local poultry sector in Ghana. The $200 million investment is expected to provide about 3,000 direct jobs in the country. This is a step to implementing government's nationwide chicken and guinea fowl production, processing and packaging projects. And that'll be all for business. We have sports coming next to stay. Now, Ghana football marks 10 years of the passing of Al Haji Sly Tete, the man who produced a big percentage of Ghanaian players who featured in the maiden World Cup appearance in 2006 in Germany. Al Haji Sly Tete, who is the founder of Liberty Professionals, produced the likes of Michael Asian, Suleiman Tari, uh, Bafo Jan, and of course, Samoa Jan, who is now Ghana's all time top scorer, the under 20 FIFA World Cup uh, winning coach. Salas Tete also uh, come from his table. Well, how best do we remember Al Haji Sly Tete? Uh, we have this for you. Al Haji Ibrahim Sly Tete was cool, calm, collected, and a relatively quiet gentleman. But away from all of that, he was one of Africa's most powerful football administrators, considering the fact that he had very strong ties and relationships with heads of federations across the continent. And also the then president of the Confederation of African Football, Isa Hayatu. It was because of this relationship, for instance, that he was able to push the then Ghana FA president, Kwesi Nyantichi, through the corridors of CAF to go through the ranks and eventually become vice president of the continental body. Alaji Sly Tete had also a lot of great vision and had established two academies, one of them in Agbadrafo in Togo and the other in Kenya. The Liberty Academy in Togo, for instance, produced a lot of good players who at a certain point formed about 80% of the playing body of the Togolese national football team. His strong ties with agents and great ones at that across Europe and other big football destinations around the world got a lot of his players to benefit greatly and ply their respective trades in other football destinations. At a club like Udinese, for instance, in the Italian Serie A, Liberty Professionals almost had an automatic slot every other football season due to Alagi Slaitete's strong ties. It is rather unfortunate that after putting up all of these great structures, his flagship brand, which is Liberty Professionals Football Club, the Scientific Soccer Lads, find themselves in the second tier of Ghana football. It is hoped that as this 10th anniversary of his passing is being celebrated by the Ghana football family, the Liberty Professionals family, led by his partner, Mr. Felix Anson, will pull themselves together and push hard to make a return to the Ghana Premier League. May Allah keep the soul of Alaji Sly Tete, a legend of Ghana football. So that's it for sports. Up next is World News.
Now, government has started the distribution of laptops to teachers of public schools starting from senior high schools. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, who launched the initiative, disclosed that the project is to help improve the quality of education by making the country globally competitive. My colleague for Stina Safo was at the launch and has come through with this report. Under the One Teacher, One Laptop initiative, public school teachers will own a laptop to aid with teaching and learning. They are, however, expected to pay 30% of the cost of the laptop, whilst government absorbs 70%. Reiterating government's resolve to digitalize the economy, Vice President Dr. Baumia urged school heads to ensure the laptops get to the teachers. One of the lessons we have learned as a country with the outbreak of COVID-19 is the urgent need to ensure that we blend the traditional physical contact with virtual platforms in the delivery of quality teaching and learning. We recognize that the transition will not be easy, both for teachers and learners, but we must start. And the government recognizes the need to provide the needed equipment and infrastructure to support this effort in our march for progress. Under the One, Lap one Teacher, One Laptop program, each teacher at every level of education, from kindergarten to senior high school, will receive a laptop. Director General of the Ghana Education Service, Kwesio Pokwa Mankwa, who chaired the launch, assured teachers the laptops will be equitably distributed across all levels. Per the arrangement, government will provide laptop to every teacher in the public school, from senior high school through junior high school, upper primary, lower primary, and to the KG. Some teachers of St. Mary's Senior High School who were among the first group of teachers to receive their laptops shared their excitement with Joy News. You know, with the COVID issue, COVID-19, it has brought a new dimension to teaching and learning all over the world. And uh, using laptop it to enhance teaching in class, I don't need to go close to my students. All I need to use to do is to just use a projector, then my lesson will reach all of them in the class. So the issue of uh, social distancing will be taken care of and other protocols that has to do with human contact will equally be limited. There are a lot of information on the internet that to be able to get those informations, you need a gadget to help you to get those informations. Um, and the laptop comes with uh, um, additional information like books and the rest. So with this, it will en uh, enhance our teaching uh, a lot. This laptop will go a long way to help us. At least it's going to ease our talking. Sometimes when you even pre-record what you have to teach on it and you use the projector, you set it up, be behind, and then the students can follow whatever you are teaching. So it's going to ease our talking, at least. We'll not talk so much. And then with some of the things from the internet, you can easily program it in such a way that even you can live it with them so that they can learn on their own. For Stina Safo, for Joy News. Now joining me via Zoom to discuss the relevance of these laptops to the teacher is Larry Adbado, editor, uh, colleagues of education, colleges of education, uh, weekly journal. He is also uh, happens to be a teacher himself. Uh, thank you so much. Now, what has been the reaction of teachers after this launch today uh, by government? Thank you very much, and it's, and good evening to your good self and your cherished viewers across the country. I think uh, the reaction of teachers today on the launch of the One Teacher, One Policy uh, has been mixed. Uh, most teachers didn't expect that government to hold a fanfare or to hold a ceremony to launch this kind of uh, initiative. Nonetheless, they are all happy about the fact that this initiative is finally set to roll out where every teacher will be given a laptop to aid him or her in the discharge of their duties. Mm. And uh, we know that uh, even though they are saying they do not expect this fanfare, uh, definitely this yeah. uh, relevant to 
the teaching to their profession. And of course, we'll be, yeah. uh, you know, we'll change the game as far as teaching yeah. is concerned. Certainly, the lack of, as you heard some of the teachers from St. Mary's talking, uh, it's going to go a long way to aid the teachers in their teaching work. For instance, uh, about two years ago, they introduced a new curriculum to our primary schools. And so now we do not have textbooks, we do not have the various teaching and learning materials to roll out the new curriculum. But we were told some time ago that the laptop that is going to provide it will contain all these relevant materials. So it's going to go a long way in helping the teachers. Uh, the current times we find ourselves, where almost everyone is now doing online teaching and learning, I think it has come at a very bright time. Uh, at a time that we are battling with this COVID pandemic, the laptops have come at a very right time where it's going to help teachers to also get themselves acquainted with this online teaching and learning. Mm. Uh, we are yet to know whether there will be special training for some of our teachers who are not very conversant with the use of search machines. But that is a topic for another day. Uh, and we know that government will be paying about 70% of the cost of the laptop, teachers will be bearing just the 30%. Uh, that is certainly good. Or are there people who are raising issues even with this? Yes, there are certainly a lot of concerns with the payments for the laptop. Uh, we've been told government is going to absorb 70% of the charge. We are told the laptop ranges around 1,005, 2,006 roughly. Okay. And government is absorbing 70% of it and each teacher will have to absorb the rest 30%. Uh, we've not been briefed with the modalities as to how even the 30% is going to be taken from teachers' salary. Uh, there were rumors some few months ago that it will be taken from their professional development allowance. Others are saying it will be broken down into several months. And, you know, at the time we find ourselves where teachers had an increment of 4%. Not everyone is so happy about the fact that government is absorbing only 70%. Left to some teachers, government should have just taken the entire course. Mm. But not, but that notwithstanding, uh, I think the 70-30 is, is actually not also a bad deal. We just wait to see how the modalities for the payment of the 30% will be rolled out. There was another thing that came up today at the launch, uh, which is not exactly on the laptops. It has to do with government's plan to roll out degrees at the colleges of ed education. This has been in the pipeline for a long time. The vice president touched on it today. I want us to listen to him and then I'll take your reaction. Okay. As part of efforts to improve the status of teachers, effective 2022, all products from the colleges of education will graduate as first degree holders and will be entering the Ghana Education Service as principal superintendents. Team period for teachers who have upgraded their skills has also been halved. Ladies and gentlemen, every profession worth its salt must have high standards for its members. And it is in line with this that the teacher licensure examination has been introduced. And this is to ensure that the right standards are in place to safeguard and guarantee the quality of education. To further enhance the status of teaching, we have introduced the professional learning communities as well as the continuous professional development systems which provide opportunities for teachers to enhance their learning. To support this development, government has introduced the continuous professional development allowance and soon this year's allowance will also be paid. And so Larry, your reaction to this? All right, I think uh, the vice president said a lot of things. Uh, with Let, let's start with the awarding of degrees. Okay, so with the award of degrees, yes, uh, the BA program 
started in 2018 across the 46 public colleges of education. God willing, uh, next year we'll be having the first batch of graduates from this BA program. Uh, I think when they graduate, they'll be enrolled for a one-year national service, yeah. after which government will now post them to their permanent stations. Uh, the thing also is that I'm happy the vice president mentioned it in his speech, but currently, the first batch of these beard students, mm -hmm. if you go into the colleges of education and you observe the nature in which they are being trained to come out and then man our classrooms, I'm not sure as a country we are happy about the approach they are currently using. And we've been raising these concerns for the past one year that look, there are serious issues in the colleges. The colleges are lacking infrastructure. As we speak, next week, the 46 public colleges of education principals, we're meeting in, uh, in Elembele to discuss issues of admissions into colleges for this year. And it's interesting to know that we are likely to see a cut down in the, in the enrollment in colleges this year because there's no infrastructure to accommodate four-year cohorts on the various campuses. Okay. So I'm happy he's mentioning this, yes, but uh, we hope and pray that next year, the first batch of BS students that will be coming out from the colleges will actually have the requisite skills that is expected of them as BA graduates to man our classrooms. Larry, thank you very much for joining us. And Larry is a teacher himself. He's also editor uh, for the journal produced by the Colleges of Education. Uh, still on education, the University of Cape Coast has been ranked among global universities for their research influence. It has also been ranked the number one university in Ghana, uh, the top university in West Africa, and part of the top five universities in Africa. The announcement was contained in the 2022 Times Higher Education Annual Rankings. Universities that published high-impact research on COVID-19 scored sawed up the league table, with China uh, reaping the most rewards. The 2022 World University Rankings include more than 1,600 universities across 99 countries and territories, making them the largest and most diverse university rankings to date. Richard Kojuniako has been interacting with the Director of Research, Innovation and Consultancy at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Frederick Atuama, uh, asking him about pertinent questions about this feat that they have chalked as a university. should be an exciting period for you at the Directorate and the University of Cape Coast. It is quite exciting for us because we have come a long way. Uh, such an achievement is not something that you do overnight. It takes careful planning. It, 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 it involves uh, scanning the horizon to look at the issues that are topical for you to engage. It calls for deep uh, thinking to see what your strategy is. So we've come a long way and we are very, very happy. Of course, during the past 60 years, UCC has have the niche for itself as a university of academic excellence. Yes, so our track record is there, but we needed to cement this by coming on board the ranking for the globe to know that UCC has arrived. But what went into this particular ranking? And is UCC a new entrant? Yes, UCC is a debutant. This is the first time the University of Cape Coast is being ranked. In the past, we attempted, but we couldn't get ranked because the entry or eligibility criteria is very stringent. There are seven concurrent eligibility criteria or inclusion exclusion criteria every university must meet before you are ranked. We were able to meet the six, but the very first criterion we struggled to meet. That means that the first criteria actually talks about publishing thousand papers, more than thousand papers within a five year span. And within each of the five years, the threshold publications you should have is 150. And here the operational phrase is uh, relevant publications. And when we say relevant publications, we are talking about papers that are indexed in Elsevier's database called Scopus. So that is what kept us from being ranked. So behind the scenes, we were doing self-introspection to ascertain why we have not been able to get that number of papers to be ranked. And we came out with a number of challenges and we 
started looking at addressing those challenges in a systematic manner. Well, he's also been engaging some researchers and students about the latest rankings. At the University of Cape Coast, and we want to speak with some of the researchers and students of the university, what they make of um, the successes chalked by the university in terms of research. Globally, uh, the university with the research influence. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Tell me how excited you are. You are a researcher and you've contributed immensely towards this. Thank you very much. I, I don't actually have the word to describe how I feel. I am super excited. I'm overly thrilled about this achievement. Of course, we at UCC, we've already, we've always known that uh, we've been doing impactful research. We've always known that uh, the type of research we do and how we disse uh, disseminate it um, is so influential in the global space. But this award come to give a testimony, it's a manifestation of what we've already known or always believed. So to say that I'm excited is just uh, uh, to, to be generous or to be mild. I am overly excited. I'm thrilled about this announcement. I, have, I was telling my colleagues that for the past 24 hours I've had to fight in quotes uh, my colleagues who have rather chosen to troll UCC rather than celebrate us. Uh, for people like that, many of them I didn't begrudge them because they didn't understand what was even the Times Higher Education University ranking. They didn't know what it was so you, we had to give them some education. But for people who know, in fact for our colleagues who are at other universities, at the University of Ghana, University of Kwame Nkrumah, University of Science and Technology, they know what the uh, Times Higher Education is about. So for such people, our colleagues, they have not been trolling us, they've rather been congratulating us. So anybody we find that is rather making a fun and mockery of this is somebody who actually needs to be given some tutelage about what is actually the Times Higher Education University rankings and what is the impact of this. Very, very happy for the achievement of the university. It's, it's a strong message to those outside there that the university is doing its best training students and teachers and helping the country achieve its maximum goal. Yes, so I'm very happy about the achievement of the university. What do you tell your colleagues in other universities? I mean, ever since this news broke, what have you been telling other colleagues in other universities? Oh, yeah, it's like we were happy and we were telling them that you see our school is the best in Ghana. But let me say, all the same, all things being equal, there are also good universities too in Ghana. Now, the Northeast Regional Minister, Idana Zakari, has called for the establishment of buffer zones in communities along the White Water River in the region as an interim measure to mitigate the impact of the annual disaster caused by the spillage of the Bagri Dam and seasonal rains. The minister explained the buffer zones will serve as a neutral area in the communities where farmers and residents alike will not be allowed to farm or build residential homes. Yeah, Idana Zakaria said it was time to institute concerted uh, commitment and efforts to sustain the fight against such disasters. He was speaking at the inauguration of the Regional Disaster Management Committee in Nalerugu, where correspondent Ilias Utako reports. The National Disaster Management Organization Act 927 establishes disaster management committees at the national, regional and district levels chaired by the Minister for the Interior, Regional Ministers and District Chief Executives respectfully. In view of this, the North East Regional Coordinating Council with the National Disaster Management Organization and with support from partners sworn into office a 15-member Regional Disaster Management Committee to regulate and coordinate disaster prevention and responses in the region. The committee is made up of a regional minister as the chairperson, the regional NADMO director as the secretary, regional heads of several departments and partners, and DCEs of the affected areas. The regional minister, Idana Zakari, speaking at the event, provided an update of the tragedy so far recorded in part of the region as a result of continued heavy downpours. This year, residents of the Northeast region have had a bitter experience. Even before they opened the Bagri Dam, their experiences were just one too many. We lost lives, we lost property, 
we lost our farms, and even lost wild life. As at the last count, we lost in total 12 lives. Eight, two drowning, one, no, three by tender strike, and another one, unfortunately, was an incident involving man and the elephants. Perennial flooding caused by heavy rains and the opening of the Bagre Dam in the last decade have killed over 200 people and millions of properties destroyed in northern Ghana. 11 people have died already this year, even as the Bagre is yet to be spilled. To end the annual disaster, the government of Ghana cut a sword for the construction of the Pualugu Multipurpose Dam project. But with the project still far from commencing, the regional minister is proposing an interim solution. And for me, one suggestion I want to make is this. Every year, they are opening Bagri Dam, Nagmo, and back on sensitization. This has gone on since Bagri Dam was actually uh, created. This year, the same sensitization is ongoing. The people will move to higher grounds. When the water level recedes, they are back to the same area. Meaning, the following year, you have another challenge. Is it not possible that when we engage with the chiefs, political authorities, religious and political leaders, we create a buffer around these areas so that when they move out, they have no basis to go back there and have their settlements established. The Director General of the National Disaster Management Organization, Nana Ajman Prempe, has appealed to persons living along the White Water to move and join relatives and friends for that period where the Bagri Dam will be spilled. He said, uh, given the impact of the continuous heavy downpour Wednesday night, there's a possibility the dam will be spilled anytime soon. The Director General of the National Disaster Management Organization made the appeal when he visited some chiefs to appreciate the effort they are putting in sensitizing their people on the havoc the spillage would cause. He said disasters are natural, but there are some measures that can be put in place to mitigate its effect. In northern part of the country, you know already the whole land is saturated with floods all over the northern part of the country and we are worried we as NADMO and government is worried because one we are losing lives and two the good people of this part of the country are harvesting their maize and other crops immaturely which is not a good thing because it might affect the local food problems and food security in the country so we are worried but it is a natural disaster. There's nothing you can do about it. As you recall quite recently, in Europe, all European countries experienced uh, floods. In America, in New York City, everywhere we experienced floods. That is a natural disaster. But we can prevent some of the effects. And that is why we are here. We are doing sensitization all over the place so that people, especially those who are living along the rivers, will move to go and stay with their friends and relatives for the period the Bagre Dam will be spilled. We all know the Bagre Dam is full at any moment from now. If the rain doesn't stop, we're going to get the spillage. We are sure that government is ready with much relief to lessen the effects of the spillage on its residents. I, 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 I know the media is always quick to ask questions about relief items when there's a disaster. But when there is a disaster, the first thing you look at is the search and rescue aspect of it. Then we do assessment to know which kinds of uh, relief items you should send to a particular place. But I want to assure you that government at NADBO is ready with much relief items to respond, to mitigate whatever the effects. The chief of Tolong, Alaji Yakubu Alahasan Tali, thanked NADMO for recognizing their effort and assured that they will continue to support in every bid. 
to blame some of the disasters on shoddy work done by contractors and choke drains. Now to the Upper West region and President of the Regional House of Chiefs there, uh, Na Dikowini Domali, has appealed to the government to take a second look at the road network in the region and make holistic and comprehensive intervention to forestall any future recurrence of devastation from floods that brought the region to its knees. The, he noted that in the region, the roads were already deplorable and was worsened by the violent floods that swept through uh, the region on August 12. He made a call during a press conference in the region. Rafik Salam reports. Violent flash floods triggered by torrential rains on August 12 swept across the Upper West region, was off some major roads, submerged several hundreds of farm hectares, affecting a little over 1,600 persons. 336 persons were also displaced following the collapse of their houses. At a press conference, President of the Upper West Region House of Chiefs, Nadu Kumuni Domale, noted that the destruction on some major roads linking districts as well as connecting the roads to the regional capital and neighboring Burkina Faso were cut off, rendering commuters stranded. Nandu Kumune Domale opened up on the roads that were washed off by the catastrophic floods. Nadolu Yuziri Babli Lora Road, Lora Kamba Nandam Road, Nadolu the Puri Japa Road, Nadolu the Fiamma Road, Wa Seripere Nadolu Road, the Fiamma Drum Wa Road, the Fiamma Barri Japa Road, Wa Wahabu Fusi Road, Japa Babli Road, Hen Tumu Road, Hen Zini Golu Road, Jefferson Golu Tumu Road, Bullinga Katua Road, Katua Yuri Kulu Road, Wichau Tam Valley, Wal Road, PC Nako Road, Kajipere Jim Pansy Road. The Tumu Navrango Road was as well not accessible as at Tuesday, the 31st of August 2021, because the bridge at Navarangue was also flooded. Whilst commending the government for safe taking to fix the roads that were cut by the violent floods, the chiefs will have a wish that government take a comprehensive look at all roads in the region. For the time being, we are more concerned with the places that are not accessible. That is our stand now. But in the long run, we are expecting government, we stated that we have been crying over our poor state of road infrastructure of this region to government after government. I remember at least two, three presidents who have gone to their residents to talk about this. So what we have stated here now is to have a comprehensive look at roads in general in the upper west, not just only those that have been washed away. Who knows whether those that are standing today will also not be washed away today. So we are asking that the government has a comprehensive look at the roads in general. Lots of farmlands in the upper west region were submerged by the floods. The chiefs in this case want government to pay compensation to the affected farmers. The NAMO should, as a matter of agency, provide temporal shelter, food items, and burdens to displaced persons and communities. The provision of other relief items, as the situation may warrant, in respect of building materials and compensation for lost farmlands, crops, and livestock should also be pursued vigorously. 
We further call on NANMU to do a more comprehensive assessment of the situation and make necessary recommendations to government to mitigate future occurrences. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wow. Let's do some stories on health now and the Childhood Cancer Society of Ghana is pushing for the inclusion of childhood cancer treatment in the list of ailments captured under the National Health Insurance Scheme. It is part of measures the society is rolling out to help address what it says is the fast rising cases of cancers among children in Ghana. Fiofilo Sakis reports right to you. There has been a consistent rise in the number of children battling cancer around the world. The situation is no different in Ghana, where at least 1,200 children are diagnosed with a condition every year. The situation may even be worse, and as the Childhood Cancer Society of Ghana projects, many more children with a condition may not even be diagnosed. People do not know about it, and here he, here he. It's not just the people as lay people but even at the healthcare treatment center, personnel do not know about childhood cancers. And that is our greatest gap for me now. Because you can preach and preach and preach and say, let them come early, let them come early. They must come early to a means of getting diagnosed. And if we do not know about it, they can come all early that we want. I'll prove it to you that it will not work. All right, treatment abandonment rates expressed by the NHI was high out of pocket expenditure I always say nobody alone, and no matter how rich, people have sold their farms, their cocoa farms. People have sold their houses. Other kids have stopped attending school because one child was diagnosed with cancer, and later the child died. May I add miserable? For well, pediatric emergency needs, that is the first point of call for children who are sick. And just try to find out those who died there at that first point of call, what did they die from? <laughs> the number four was what in there. Very interesting. Highest cost of number four got in there. But I've settled their cancers. So about 14 of them, which is almost half of number four or so, probably had cancer that they never got diagnosed. This is a tertiary institution. So they got to the care and immediately died or something happened. We never got to a diagnosis and died. 29-year-old Prince Nyamadi was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of 11 and struggled with it for years until he was finally cured. And that was at great cost to his family. Um, I'm Prince Nyamadi. Um, I'm a biomedical scientist by profession and I'm a leukemia survivor. So I was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of 11 at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. But before then, you know, leukemia has uh, some signs and symptoms just like any other conditions that we know of, like headache, like fatigue, like loss of appetite and all that. So before my diagnosis, you know, I had uh, well, I didn't know, so we were treating malaria with uh, anti-malaria drugs and all that. And before, I wasn't feeling too good again after all those treatments, so I was referred to Kolebu. And then I was diagnosed with acute, leukeme uh, acute uh, leukemia, that was at age 11, as I already said. Uh, from there, you know, we all know in Ghana, it's very costly to treat childhood cancers. So what happened was that after I was diagnosed, I was lucky to have my parents because they were willing to spend every kobo on me to make sure that I'm being cured of cancer. And so what they did was that, yes, they, they, there were some properties that were, that were being sold because of, you know, the treatment and all that. But, you know, with perseverance and uh, with some commitment from my parents, I went through the treatment successfully and I'm now a survivor. At the first annual general meeting of the Childhood Cancer Society of Ghana, First Lady Rebecca Ekufuado expressed concern about the high rate of the condition among children and called for action. All I can say is that your work is cut out for you. You have a leading role as practitioners and advocates to ensure our children are able to access effective, quality, life-saving care anywhere in Ghana. Your vision of cure for all children affected by cancer in Ghana is a charge to make a difference in the outcomes for Ghanaian children. Our children need you. Our policymakers need you. 
indeed Ghana needs you. I am happy to note that your members include medical professionals, psychologists, nutritionists, social workers, teachers, even chaplains and imams. This represents the multidisciplinary teams that are required to deliver holistic quality care to children affected by cancer. Indeed, if we really want to overcome the challenges associated with childhood cancers, we have to work together. The Ghana Health Service believes early detection will go a long way to help increase the survival rate. From the presentation, we've realized that early treatment, early diagnosis is extremely, extremely important. If we don't have, we don't know what is there, we will never be able to treat it. Uh, Dr. Zetizu's presentation showed us all the various entry points. And so all our strategies should look at our health-seeking behavior. Where do they go to? The chemical shops. And it's true, they come to us. And unfortunately also for us, even they want to look at This is Johnny's Prime with me and this minute. We're taking a break on Worry 10. We have more business stories for you. Yeah, welcome to business. I'm Charles IT. As part of measures to boost its sourcing of raw materials locally, leading beverage manufacturer Guinness Ghana Breweries Limited has commissioned its ultra modern brew house. There is more in this report. Guinness Ghana Breweries Company Limited has launched a state of the art brew house to augment its production in Ghana. According to managing director of the company, Helen Wisi, 70% of raw materials are sourced locally. Hence, the expansion will increase productivity of local farmers. We have 210,000 beneficiaries across the value chain just because we have an enormous farming program set up to find sorghum in Ghana. Now, at this point, so we started in 2012 and 12% of our local raw materials were sourced locally. Now we are at 61% local sourcing. We want to take that up to 70%. And that's actually why this new brew house is so important. So also now in Achimota, we can produce our beers, our maltas, with sorghum grown in Ghana. She indicated that a collaboration between government and the private sector will boost productivity and generate revenue for the economy. So the government has indicated its planting for foods and jobs program. And that uh, included also a concession on local raw materials. And for us it's really important because that has stimulated our investment of over 25 million here in this brew house. And yes, um, of course, a stable business environment is good for business in total and it's good for investors to come to the country. Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry Dr. Herbert Krapa speaking at the commissioning said government is embarking on aggressive industrialization to encourage value addition in Ghana. Currently, um, through the National Export Development Strategy, uh, we are implementing what we call the uh, export development drive to move exports from 2.5 billion Ghana cities to 25 billion Ghana cities in a matter of 10 years. Uh, we have signed on to the African continental free trade area. What we want to do is to ensure that Ghana is ready by way of operating environments, by way of our economic situation, to help manufacturers attract in the necessary foreign direct investment to be able to add value to our raw materials and export into Africa. You know that to be able to take advantage of the free trade area. Guinness Ghana says its new brewery will aid in the promotion of the use of sorghum and maize sourced locally in beer production. The company believes this will provide employment and increase productivity for local farmers. So we have winners for the Renewable Energy Contest for the Northern Zone. They are general art students of the Jamal Pensan Senior High Technical School. Led by two girls, they won with an innovation that generates electricity from plants, bacteria and soil. The challenge is an initiative by the Energy Commission and Bui Power Authority to inculcate in these students the skills to, de to develop pragmatic solutions to Ghana's energy challenges. Prince Apia witnessed the zonal contest and our report. It burns longer than the traditional charcoal. Next slide. 
Eight schools representing the northern sector participated in the zonal competition held in Kumasi that brought out solutions to Ghana's energy problems. After more than five hours of fierce display of innovative solutions, Jamai Pensai Senior High Technical School emerged winners. Having won the regional competition weeks ago, they had to beat Achinsua SHS and Navongo SHS for the zonal title. General art students, Janet Oheman Kansa and Kristolav Mogo Arthur led the renewable energy team. At first, our school was low, but now after the, um, the regionals and with this one, our school is going and everybody is beginning to know Jamal Pensen Senior High School, so this project has brought a lot of things to us. This project means a lot to us because it, it, it can even pave way for us to join or go into the engineering work. Although it was for science, but we are general students, but we offer um, integrated science. This is not taught in class, but it can also help others who don't offer science to join. For the zonals, we were able to power small appliances as in the regionals, but we're expecting that in the nationals, we, are, we will be able to power big appliances like the television, refrigerators, from converting the DC current to the AC current. We wanted to do everything possible that will help us to get a higher voltage to prove to the world that really we have power in the soil that can be able to use to power our appliances in the homes. We produce 9 volts for the first one and this one that we brought for the zona competition was around 50 volts. Other participants included business SHS, St. Francis Girls SHS, Salaga SHS, and Kwanza Technical Institute and Sunyani SHS. Director of Science Education at the Ghana Education Service, Mrs. Olivia Sewa Paris says the initiative is critical to empowering girls. We are really developing talent in these little ones, including leadership skills, partnership, critical thinking, innovation, communication, collaboration, and looking at the way they were able, able to use the internet to project their work. This shows that the government agenda in promoting digital literacy is being done over here. And because looking at the presentations, we are solving problems and it is in line with the SDGs. You see, there was something on climate change, waste management and energy. Director for a Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency at the Ghana Energy Commission, Kofi Jako says the participants will be supported to better their innovations. What is very, very impressive is that these young ones who are the future leaders are going to form a crop, a generation whose understanding of renewable energy and energy efficiency will be different from those of us now. So that in their era, you are going to see more than what you are seeing today. And that is where we are going to spend efforts and energy, resources, to ensure that we encourage them to, to be able to harness all these talents in them for the benefit of the nation. We Power Authority partnered with the Energy Commission for this project. Wisdom Ahiataku Tokugbo is the director at the executive office of the We Power Authority. I can say that the students have a lot of talents and most of these talents are hidden. We need programs like this to bring these talents out. And this is one of the reasons why We Power Authority decided to partner with Energy Commission so that we can help add value and bring out these talents from the students. Achinsua Senior High School and Navrongo Senior High School will join Jama and Pensai for the national competition. Officials say the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and the Bruhamond Energy Centre at KNUST will help refine the ideas and projects of the students. Prince Apia, reporting.
Now, US-based entrepreneur has been speaking to Joy News, Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin, on a few lessons she's picked up on her journey. She's encouraging startups to not give up, date, to not, you know, give up despite the odds. We have more in this report. A lot of people is uh, ambitious here. Okay, I'm, I can't speak for all Americans, but a lot of people is more ambitious here. However, when it comes to Ghana, it's, it's like, you're lucky if you get an opportunity, okay? And America is different. So Portia disclosed most people she has met in Ghana want to relocate to the U.S. So when people come to me and be like, I want to go to America, I tell them, you're already in America. You have someone look exactly like you in America trying to figure out how they're going to travel as well. So it's just almost like the same thing. I'm literally watching both worlds. During an entrepreneurship training for 15 members of the Scout and Guide Fellowship of Ghana, she encouraged participants to discover their talents and be creative. Try, if you have to. Try by word of mouth, try by social media, try by uh, being creative, talented. Just try. Try to expand or discover your gifts and your talents so you could be seen as the star, as different. Okay. She trained them on candle color coding and what they can do to earn an income. She also acknowledged the generosity of Ghanaians compared to the United States of America. One, the people are really generous in Ghana. Um, they they very welcoming. Also. Um, it's different from the United States, of course. The living, the culture, the food, the everything. Everything is completely different, but yet the same. Portia okay? says she was uh, ignorant about Ghana and thought she could uh, only see lions, giraffes, among other animals. I think that people should know more about this culture in Africa, because before I came, I was really ignorant to what Ghana is really about. I was expecting to see like giraffes, tigers, lions, I don't know, but not no regular house, you know, it is a developing country, but I was expecting to see like, I don't know, like little, uh, like straw dresses, I don't know. Well, that'll be all for business. We have sports coming next to stay. And Ghana got off to a good start in the 2022 World Cup qualifier after beating Ethiopia one goal to nil at the Cape Coast Stadium tonight. And Mubarak Wakasu scored the only goal of the game in the 35th minute. So we are definitely off to a good start and uh, still talking about the four-time African champions, the Black Stars. Rahim Ayu, brother of Black Stars captain Andrew Ayu, says the outside players... Uh, you know, leadership quality is commendable. For him, Rahim is, uh, you know, qualified, has what it takes to lead Ghana to the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Andre has always been a leader, you know, wherever he has been. So I wouldn't say much. So he has the quality. I mean, I, I always say he was born for it. So but hopefully, I mean, he's doing great things now. So I just hope for the best. And I always pray that, you know, he do great things for the national team, which he did with the under 20, you know, which has never been done before. So I just hope when I mean, things get well or things continue as, it, as I mean, it's going. Those who were there before him, they did what they can, you know. They did what they could. He too, he has come. He's doing what, you know, leader, being a leader does not mean that um, they just take the banner and give it to you. You have to have certain qualities. Not everyone can be a leader. So. That's it for sports. If you're watching us on Join East Prime, that's it for the bulletin. We're grateful for your company throughout the week. From me and the rest of the team, we say have a great weekend. My name is Ernest Megan. Hello, my name is Evans Mensa, and you can relive all the fun and excitement on Top Story, News Night, and of course, Ghana Connect via podcast. All you need to do is to log on to my joy online slash podcast. 
Search for your favorite show and relive the moment. Joy 99.7 FM, your radio for discerning listeners. Welcome to News File. 